Welcome to the NTN Nightly. I'm Nisha Charles. This edition's top stories. The government of St. Lucia takes a significant step in establishing a national human rights framework. A monument in honor of Francis Mindu Philip has been unveiled. Works on phase two of the Denry North Water Rehabilitation Project are advancing. All that plus the latest in youth development, sports, and the NTN Wapo Creole. The Department of External Affairs on Monday, 11 February, officially opened a two-day inaugural meeting of the National Coordinating Committee. This meeting is of major national significance as it serves to establish St. Lucia's national human rights framework. The United Nations has been emphasizing the necessity for all countries, particularly small island developing states, to organize their reporting on human rights. Human rights reporting has been a challenge for countries, especially small island developing states. To help St. Lucia submit its report in a quicker manner, the UNDP along with the Department of External Affairs are setting up a National Coordinating Committee to assist in the process. Michelle Brathwaite is the National Human Rights Advisor for the United Nations Development Program for Barbados and the OECS. Primarily capacity development, um, helping government officials better understand the international human rights system, what are the expectations of a country after a country has ratified a treaty, as well as um, engaging in the international human rights uh, processes of the United Nations. So helping government officials to better understand those processes and how to draft reports to better engage with those mechanisms. The Caribbean region has struggled to get in its human rights reports. So many countries are five years behind, 10 years behind, 20 years behind on the human rights reporting. So the record is not good. But with that said, my position and the capacity development uh, um, assistance that I'm offering countries is a recognition on the UN's part that small island developing states struggle with this responsibility. So while most countries are far behind on most of their human rights reports, there's an understanding about the capacity um, and human resource limitations that small island developing states have, and that's part of the reason I'm here to assist. According to Binta Ernest, the Foreign Service Officer with the Department of External Affairs, it is a national obligation to report on such matters and in a timely manner. We've signed on to these national, international treaties and part of the obligation of signing on to a treaty, becoming a state party to a treaty is periodic reporting. And because we have been challenged resource-wise, human resource-wise, so it's been kind of a challenge for St. Lucia to provide these reports in a timely manner to the UN agencies. So I think there is a misconception of what human rights is. I always say that St. Lucians or even us in the, in the Caribbean and Caracom states, we're like, we have no human rights issues because we, we view human rights from one lens, like gross human rights violations. But we have our own, like I said, realities when it, when it comes to human rights in St. Lucia. And I don't think we're doing enough because I think it needs to be demystified, first of all. People need to understand what is human rights. We, we say very broadly human rights, but there are different thematic areas in human rights. And if we look at it in that, in that manner, I think that we can better be able to digest it as opposed to seeing it as one big broad human rights. The inaugural meeting of the National Coordinating Committee for Human Rights is being held from February 11th to the 12th. 2019. A monument erected in honor of Francis Mindu Philip was unveiled on the weekend. Mindu is regarded as the greatest St. Lucian sportsman of his time who represented St. Lucia in cricket and football in various capacities with distinction for over 25 years. Anissa Antoine reports. The Castries Constituency Council, in collaboration with the Monument Committee, dedicated the Mindu Philip Monument. Philip retired from representative cricket in 1969 and assumed the roles of national cricket and football coach, selector for the national team, president of the St. Lucia Empires Association, and stayed on at the Victoria Park as a curator. In March 1979, Victoria Park was renamed Mindu Philip Park in his honor. Dunstan Dubule is the chairman of the Monument Committee. We decided that considering the monumental contribution Mindu made in the field of sport in St. Lucia and the fact that very little recognition had been forthcoming. We felt we had to do something to really preserve his, his, his memory and his legacy. The structure was designed by the late Stanley French who was one of the Caribbean's leading playwrights and a member of the Monument Committee. 
The Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Honorable Alan Chastney, commended the Committee on their tenacity in safeguarding the completion of the monument. There are some of us who may not have ever met the great Francis Minder Philip during his lifetime, but most St. Lucians know a lot about him. A monument to Mindu existed at this site before, but it appears that its upkeep left a lot to be desired. And I've always said that, that the true characteristic of a country is how we remember our elders. And there is nothing more symbolic than that, than our cemeteries. And I think that this monument to him is a great, great um, statement by St. Lucians. The ceremonial cutting of the ribbon to officially declare the handover was done by Helen Phillip, the widow of the late Francis Mindu Phillip. I am overwhelmed by this awesome and imposing structure built in honor of Mindu. On behalf of my family and myself, I would like to express our gratitude and appreciation to the government of St. Lucia, the late Stanley French, Dunstan, and the other members of the Monument Committee for the effort in creating this magnificent monument, which is bound to preserve the memory and legacy of my late husband, Francis Mendo Philip. The chairman of the committee presented the keys for the monument to the mayor of Castries, His Worship Peter St. Francis. From the Government Information Service, I am Anicia Antoine reporting. Plans are running full steam ahead for the commencement of works on Phase 2 of the Denry North Water Rehabilitation Project. Having completed the first set of work in this multi-phase initiative, which saw the construction of a raw water intake, the installation of transmission facilities to the newly constructed treatment plant, and the distribution of facilities inclusive of pumping stations to the existing Tomazo tank, the success of Phase 1 ensures that 500,000 gallons of well-treated pipe-borne water can be distributed regularly to residents in the lower communities of Denry North. We hear more from the Ministry of Agriculture's Amanda Faye Clark. Chairman of the Board of Directors of Wasco, Francis Dembo, says much applause needs to be given to the governments of St. Lucia and Mexico, which worked assiduously to secure funding to begin the much-needed intervention to improve the socio-economic conditions of the people of Denry North. For this, we must commend the excellent workmanship of Vinci Construction, CIE, the government of St. Lucia, which provided funding in the sum of 1.6 million U.S. dollars, and most importantly, the Mexican government, through the local embassy that provided extremely generous grant funding to the tune of five million dollars, five million US dollars, that is, to kickstart this important project. Phase two will also ensure that water is provided at higher elevation with the installation of booster pumping stations in specific areas. Parliamentary representative for Denry North, Honorable Sean Edwards, says the completion of phase one and the commissioning of work in this new phase is a milestone achieved, and that which signals the end of decades of struggle where water rehabilitation is concerned in his constituency. For me, this water project is very, very important. I know we have waited a long time. I know we have gone to different agencies to try and get it to happen and happen in quick time. Minister with responsibility for the island's water resources, Honorable Ezekiel Joseph says, he applauds the recent accomplishments gained by way of an overall reduced cost of funding for the rehabilitative works. And I want to say here today that we made a number of changes to this project. Changes that will cause us to reduce on the cost of the project. Like you heard from the, your rep, and it's correct. Phase one was a load, was a grant. But phase two is a loan. The main contractors, Vinci Construction, will use smaller contractors from the Denry North community for support to carry on its mandate and work schedule over the next 12 months. Phase two of the Denry North Water Rehabilitation Project is scheduled to begin immediately. From the Information Unit of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources and Cooperatives, I am Amanda Fee Clark reporting. In keeping with changes in international oil prices and government's application of the modified market pass-through petroleum pricing mechanism, 
The retail price of the LPG 20 and 22 pound cylinders, gasoline and diesel remains unchanged. The prices of LPG 100 pound cylinder and kerosene have been changed. The price changes take effect from Monday, February 11, 2019. The 20-pound LPG cylinder remains unchanged at $32.91. The 22-pound cylinder also remains unchanged at $36.48. The 100-pound cylinder increased from $204.95 to $207.07 per cylinder. However, kerosene decreased from $9.50 to $8.21 per gallon. Gasoline has maintained at $13.95 per gallon. Diesel has also remained at $13.95 per gallon. The next adjustment of the retail prices for fuel products will be on Monday, March 4th, 2019. And this is the NTN Nightly. Coming up, the latest happenings in youth and sports with Ryan O'Brien. Food safety is a scientific discipline describing handling, preparation, and storage of foods in ways that prevent foodborne illness. Here are some food safety tips. Be careful when purchasing food items on sale. Examine all items carefully prior to purchasing. Check for damage to food items and expiration dates. When purchasing local meat from butchers, look for the inspected and past stamp which indicates that the meat has been inspected by the Department of Environmental Health. Avoid keeping foods such as meat, fish, chicken, or foods requiring refrigeration in your vehicle or other location for over 4 hours. Before preparing foods and in between handling raw meat or chicken, wash hands thoroughly with soap and warm water and dry thoroughly. Use a separate cutting board and utensil for your raw meats. Prepare foods as close as possible to mealtime. Refrigerate leftovers immediately after mealtime and use refrigerated leftovers within 2-3 to three days. When reheating food, ensure that it is steaming hot to at least 75 degrees Celsius. A message from the Bureau of Health Education in the Ministry of Health, Wellness, Human Services and Gender Relations. Welcome back. Council workers who have enhanced their skill set have been duly recognized for their efforts. We will have the details in a moment, but first, we join Ryan O'Brien for the latest happenings in youth development and sports. Hello and welcome to today's update on some of the programs and activities under the auspices of the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports. News from the Inter-Secondary Schools Table Tennis Singles and Doubles events played on Friday. St. Joseph's Convent and Castries Comprehensive Secondary School dominated the championships. The girls' doubles event saw the St. Joseph's Convent duo of Zarian Anthony and Maya George defeating all their opponents in straight sets to retain their girls' doubles title. Lenore Ajuda and Aviona Edmund, also from St. Joseph's Convent, finished second, whilst a mixed pair of St. Joseph's Convent Angelique Richardson and Babino's Giselle McGowan finished third. The boys' doubles then saw Castries Comprehensive's DeAndre Cauldron and Ishmael Mois make light work of all their opponents to retain their doubles title. Corim Secondary, Tanel Bernard and Max William finished second while Castries Comprehensive Secondary Schools Shernan Janke and Colvin Paul finished third. The mixed doubles event saw the Castries Comprehensive Secondary Schools DeAndre Cauldron teaming up with St. Joseph's Convent Zardian Anthony to win the event. TCSS's Ishmael Moiz and SJC's Maya George finished second, whilst Babano Nate John and St. Joseph's Convent Lenore Ajuda placed third. The girls' singles saw St. Joseph's Convent capturing all the podium spots. Tadian Anthony won her second singles title in three years. Joel Sinclair finished second, whilst Angelique Richardson and Lenore Ajuda finished third. The boys' singles saw DeAndre Cauldron stamping his dominance against all of his opponents to retain his singles title. Ishmael Moise, also from the Castries Comprehensive Secondary School, placed second was Babano Secondary's Kenneth John and Nate John placed third. St. Joseph's Convent, Zarian Anthony was the female MVP, capturing goal in a team's event, girls doubles, mixed doubles, and girls singles. She competed unbeaten in the entire competition. Castries Comprehensive Secondary School's Deandre Cauldron was named male MVP, capturing goal in the team's event, boys doubles, mixed doubles, and boys singles. He played the entire championship without 
dropping a set. Minister responsible for Youth Development and Sports, the Honorable Edmund Estefan, has urged football administrators to continue with the efforts to have more football played on island. Minister Estefan made the remarks while delivering an address during Saturday's awards put on by the St. Lucia Football Association Incorporated. He pledged government support in making this a reality and emphasized his interest in seeing leagues having their competitions being played simultaneously and subsequently fielding teams in national competition. Now a reminder for all schools participating in this year's Mass United Insurance Under-19 Schools Cricket Competition that participants must be under 19 years of age on September 1st in the year of the competition and that subject to special conditions. All matches shall be played under the laws of cricket as laid down by the MCC at the time. All matches shall consist of one innings per side, each innings being limited to 50 overs and completed on the same day. National Sports Awards are fast approaching and there will be a final briefing for the local media on Wednesday, February 13th at the conference room at the Ministry from 10 in the morning. That same evening, all nominees are being invited to a meeting at the same location to familiarize themselves with their roles and responsibilities during the awards. That's all from us today. I'm Ryan O'Brien. Thanks, Ryan. The Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment have recognized council workers who have enhanced the skill sets by completing a plumbing training program. Chevroy Marius has the details. To augment the ministry's public facility maintenance efforts, six local government council employees successfully completed a plumbing skills maintenance program at Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. At a ceremony on Wednesday, February 6, 2019, the council workers were handed certificates to recognize their accomplishments. Deputy Permanent Secretary Ms. Lenita Joseph commended the workers for their efforts. So I'm really pleased to be standing here today just to congratulate you on finishing the program and you have my commitment and support that we will continue to find initiatives that we can help to build the vocational skills of the councillors and the workers of the councils. The participants were very thankful for being given this opportunity. Well actually I already do one course on basic plumbing and then I did that one. So it pushed me to get to know more things. I get to know more techniques. And then I want to thank the ministry and thanks this one or two for pushing me. The research unit of the ministry undertook a national public standpipe facility assessment exercise from 2016 to 2017. One of the recommendations was to get council employees certified in the trade of plumbing. Reporting from the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, I am Chevrolet Marius. And stay with the NTN Nightly. Up next, Primus Hutchinson is here with the NTN Wapo Aquayol. There are signs everywhere. Pay attention whether you're male or female. Visit your health center to get screened. It's a preliminary test to determine if you are exposed to the HIV virus, an STI, or tuberculosis. Some people who are HIV positive also have tuberculosis. But there is hope. Tuberculosis can be cured. And yes, you can live a full life with HIV. Talk to your doctor. Be responsible. Help stop the spread of TB, HIV. Encourage everyone to get tested. Welcome back. Time now for the NTN Wapo Creole with Primus Hutchinson. Mr. Madame, Department of West Coast Pour Information and Gouvernement de la Société GIS, à ce moment-là, Télévision Nationale PIA NTN, qui a présenté une nouvelle Creole, présenté au Primus Hutchinson. Département des Affaires Finances, j'ai développé un plan pour trois années pour l'occasionner département de la Salle plus effectivement à voir ces affaires qui ont été adressées. C'est la meilleure manière pour découvrir l'argent qui est public là pour aussi établir une meilleure affaire de recherche, une manière pour ménager la dette, un meilleur service pour les pratiques et pour agenduer plus le développement économique. Assistant pour le directeur de finances qui est responsable pour l'administration, Philomène Sinclair, déclare qu'il a commencé à faire plan depuis le mois de mai l'année passée. Ça de développement de la ça c'est CARICAD, aussi 
très engagé dans le développement de plan ça là. C'est le sens clair, a pas mis ces divers objectifs et initiatives qui sont capables pour développer cette salle qui a aussi assisté le département de finance pour renforcer la meilleure coordination à ces diverses divisions qui ont mis. Le directeur exécutif pour CARICAD, Devon Rowe, dit que l'attention est pour aider et improuver à ce capacité de 77 CPI Caribla pour ménager et planer l'activité. Le département de finance n'y a pas qui a ça a implémenté ces plans là commencé en mois d'avril l'année ici. Le département de santé, chaque a pris une démarche pour contrôler la maladie de la rigole et pour empêcher la maladie de la rigole en pays. Alors, il y a placé les professionnels de santé au lieu de cette ici. Ces professionnels de santé ont trouvé l'occasion pour recevoir des informations concernant les meilleures démarches qui sont faites pour abattre et contrôler les vermines de la rigole. Là, il y a un atelier qui a été assisté récemment. Officier qui est responsable pour adresser à faire santé en ministère de santé, Dr. Sharon Belmer George, déclare que malgré cette liste pour controuver maladie ça là depuis après l'année 1990, quand même, il est nécessaire pour les travailleurs dans faire santé venir au courant et puis manière pour ça découvrir maladie ça là et pour ça adresser plus vite que possible. Dr. Belmer George a ajouté que parce que ni si tellement longtemps maladie ça là attaquer mon pays alors il est nécessaire pour ce travail et santé ça là trouver toute information et étonnement pour si un cas maladie ça là tomber à son nous en pays encore docteur George en ce qui il observé pour ces 10 ans qui passé l'année les parents qui pratiquent à faire enfants au point ces pitié pour protéger ces enfants ça là contre maladie qualité ces maladie ça là alors il a fait un appel pour yo porter ces enfants ça là en ces health centers là pays pour trouver pitié qui va protéger yo haute qualité maladie comme ça Officier santé a remarqué que la rougeole, c'est un vermin qui a simé rapidement. Par conséquent, depuis que les gens trouvent, il est possible pour simer. Et ça, c'est ni c'est ça qui peut visiter le pays. Si les gens ont voyagé dans l'autre pays, alors Dr. George a fait un grand appel pour les parents pour porter des issues dans ces health centers là, cette ci pour recevoir la protection de la maladie, la rougeole. Il y a une grande compagnie qui est très avancée dans le bâtiment, à faire ingénieur et à faire comme ça car on force et fort un programme pour projet de développement nouveau et le port Hewanora. Et j'en ai plus que 10 ans qui comprennent ça là car on pourrait et puis cela se en divers projets en pays cette ci Mais ce qui est responsabilité pour faire port et travailler en cette ci honorable Stephenson King déclare que la compagnie ça là a été engagée en développement nouveau en aéroport Hewanora. Côté plusieurs changements qu'il a fait pour faire possible pour l'aéroport procurer procurer un premier service. Selon M. King, projet a pour l'aéroport qui a donné un haut degré tout bonnement et qui a facilité le service qui est bien avancé comme n'importe aéroport international. On a King a annoncé que le gouvernement a aussi servi l'établissement aéroport qui a existé pour le présent pour protéger l'autre service qui est nécessaire. Selon M. King, et au point nouveau, il y en aura caillons qui neuf et puis toutes sortes de qualités d'équipements nouveaux qui sont très avancés. Mais c'est qu'il n'y a pas que le gouvernement qui a présenté le plan en ces semaines-là qui est venu. Célébration 47e anniversaire de l'indépendance de cette ci qui a duré pour une année complète. Selon le chef du comité pour la célébration, le sénateur honorable John N. Girodi McIntyre, a mis ce grand spectacle-là, caillons bal musique western qui a pris un coup en mois d'avril et qui a eu l'autre activité pour bien venir cette liste qui est un pays, un autre pays en mois de juillet. Mme McIntyre a déclaré que, à part de ces activités que le comité a déjà organisé pour ces communes dans le pays, c'est une compétition domino, un spectacle spécial pour la famille, activité en secteur agricole et aussi pour les pêcheurs en mois de juillet pour observation faite les pêcheurs. Chef comité, le sénateur honorable Janine Girodi McIntyre, qui a fait assurance là, qui aussi le comité a fait tout ce qui est possible pour faciliter la transportation pour le public là, sortir en toute commune pour venir célébrer le 40e anniversaire de l'indépendance. C'est ici. Et c'est comme ça que nous avons une nouvelle nouvelle pour aujourd'hui. Mesdames, mesdames, je vous remercie autant pour garder, je vous remercie pour l'invitation. Pour que vous encore, si vous avez la vie, côté de vous présenter à l'autre. Merci en pile, Primus. 
We've been experiencing moderate to brisk easterly winds and above normal seas, which will continue over the next few days. Here's a look at what's happening to us weather-wise. Winds will be blowing from the east near 23 miles per hour or 37 kilometers per hour with a few gusts. The weather fair to partly cloudy and breezy with a few isolated showers. Tides for Castries Harbour was low at 2.14 p.m. and will be high at 8.35 p.m. Tides for Vieux Fort Bay was low at 3.41 p.m. and will be high at 9.42 p.m. The seas moderate to locally rough with waves 5 to 8 feet or 1.5 to 2.4 meters. Small craft operators and sea bavers are advised to exercise caution due to brisk winds and rough seas. Sun set today at 6.07 p.m. and will rise tomorrow at 6.28 a.m. Here's the weather summary. Moderate to brisk easterly winds and above normal seas will continue around the eastern Caribbean islands over the next few days. Low-level clouds moving along this wind flow will bring occasional showers over the Lesser Antilles during the forecast period. And that brings us to the end of the NTN Nightly. Join us next time at 7 p.m. with a repeat at 7 a.m. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel.